There's my web from hello. It's Friday, it's PLO. It's a lot of fun. I opened four tables we're going to play at micro gaming network today. Thought about should we play in here or at stars? But let's see what the games are today here. And then maybe next week we can enjoy having fun with the Poker Stars. And HUD is starting to show up. All right. Um, welcome. Today we're going to play PLO, of course, and we are going to. At least I hope we are going to discuss about creating HUD and using HUD. There was some discussion yesterday in a Finnish PLO evening in the end about HUD, but the topic is so wide and I have a lot to say about that. So I thought about saving it, saving it up for today. But when we have a spare time, I will start to talk about HUD. How should you create one? Should you buy someone else's HUD or just copy someone else's HUD? And is HUD even a good thing about poker or in poker? Uh, demo 4, top pair, wrap. But no action. And vital 777 is BP high base 74. So, yes, he's going to be marked with the green pointer. Program <laughs> Minias um, chat is working, Twitch chat is working, everything seems to work. So please be active in the chat. Keep up the discussion. If you don't have anything to say about the games on the screen, you can talk about anything. I don't mind. I like when the chat is active. Uh. And now, when the poker tracker is actually working, instead of yesterday or last week when we played in Unibet, now if you see something funny or interesting or want me to explain something why I did what I did, just say the table number one two on the top three four on the bottom and what was my hand, so I can easily find it from my hand history and we can do it and. I have tried this for over a year now. What I want to do is to mark one hand and then open it in proper choose at the end of the session. And I've been trying to do this so many times, but I always fail it. So if you see an interesting spot today, just Save. It can be big pot, it can be small pot, whatever. Just give me one hand that I can open in poker shoes and achieve in that. Um, here, open and close the flop. Another thing is that if he doesn't have a flush, then he has some kind of king, and we have decent equity versus that. If I had total air, then I probably would barrel this turn. But yeah, we can check. And now, if he bets the river, he's so thighish. Sample size is only 13 hands, but he's played only one of those 13 hands. So I'm pretty sure that he has a flush here quite, quite often. So I'm going to follow this trade. Um, 
Krupa is asking the tweets that what about yesterday's piano? Well, yesterday's piano in Unibet was horrible is the wrong word. We don't have horrible sessions, but we had a session where we ran pretty bad and we made correct decisions but lost step after step after step and we ended up hundred dollars losses which means about 10 buy-ins so it was quite quite badish badish sessions and i have no idea about your unibet nickname no idea Um, I'm sure you will tell us. Um, here on table two, we had double shooty daisies. Um, I always, always three bit double shooty daisies. The hand is just too strong to flat call. If we had the money in versus rainbow aces, we are 60 40 favorite or even more. Uh, here on table one, I isolate the mean opener. And now on paired board we have open ender and back doors and open end has raised four out of fourteen times. So this is kind of spot that he might raise with any flush draws and so on. So I'm going to check. And then let's see what he does. Uh, I'm sure he is going to bet here quite often. And here the problem is that our hand died on the river. Oh. And 120, I'm going to call here. And on this river, I'm going to, if he chips, I'm going to bet. Because um, I think he wouldn't bet over pair here quite often, unless he has a 7 or 9 or aces. And we have on king high, so any ace high beats us, any small pocket pair beats us. If he has small pocket pair, he is probably going to flaunt. Because when we have called the turn, uh, Check flop call turn is somewhat standard line also with over pairs. On table four we open nice kings, but when the flop is ace high with another flush draw, the hand just dies. And this is <coughs> important in PLO, even the best starting hand. Ace, Ace, King, King, Double Suit is a drawing and you are drawing, drawing to get a good flop. Here the river is kind of interesting. One might actually argue about value betting against the Queen. There's no one bet the river. I'm going to make a small value bet if someone has the, like this minus 777 might call me with the queen. But they don't. <laughs> no one should have aces or full house there. They might have, but most of the time they don't. Provor, if he has an ace, he's going to bet the river for sure. And now we have a flush draw and a cut shot and some overs. Let's see the river. And he has trips. So it was Kuba with Qtip1 who made ace chap chap 3 3 bet 3 flop. Oh my god, how drunk were you? Because uh, I remember yesterday there was there was UTG open, if I remember right, and there were like two callers. I was third one, or there was it was a four or five way, both 
but it was UTG open and couple of colors and then Kuma made a three bed with ace jack jack three three spades uh, quite horrible I have a, some kind of rundown with the jack and flop was something like jack six something and I had a jack six and the money went in and he had ace jack jack three so I don't know how drunk Kuba was but that three bet is as I said in the stream that three bet is horrible I, there's there isn't any logical justification for the three bet because it, it's quite quite a lot minus EV three bet <coughs> but of course when you hit the nuts and someone hits top two pairs <coughs> you get the money in with 100% equity now they bought three died let's see if we can find another one there it is these two are so tight Oh, nice turn on demo tree. Check back, paid out. Woo! And BPIP 83, really aggressive. Uh, if the board was rainbow, then I would just call. But here, it, there is a flush draw. And, I don't want to give an almost free flush draw, so I, I'm going to raise for a pawn. If they want to draw for the flush, they have to pay for it. Um, here we have top two. I'm going to hit in versus VPIB 88. Or he folds, which is nice. And they both fold as expected. Uh, about slow playing there, the thing is that around 40% of the time the river flushes or bears the board, which means that we kind of value bet. So almost half of the time the river is bad and our slow play fires back. And when it's a half a pot bet, we just give odds for all the draws, all the flush draws, maybe some sets, shouldn't be a lot of sets, but there might be. If we just call, we give them odds, and it's still hard. Even if the river is a blank, it's hard to get value unless they have some kind of hand. And if they have some kind of made hand, they can keep the value on the turn already. So, always, when you think about slow playing, you have to have a good reason why the slow playing is better than just playing it aggressively. <laughs> And now we have five tables open. There were a couple of meats on the tables. No action on table four. AC is on table two, and everyone is so neat that that this table is not good. Um, we have two backdoor flush draws and king nine duels. Uh, if he shoves, I'm going to get it in. Yes, he has king nines and sets, but he also has some random kings. And we, even with the backdoor flush draws, we get. Even when it's two pairs, almost enough equity. Queen A, I'm going to value back here. And for protection. Another ace is, oh, it's ace's fest. 
avalanche of ACs. And we hit the set. And on table four, I'm going to create value on the turn. Now we have a set and flush draw. Even if he raises, it's enough equity. But no action. Evestina called the flop with just the middle pair and cut shot. So he is or she is our friend. Um Kuba, you're saying on the Twitch that you try to steal the pot free flop. Um that's a really bad idea because generally expressing PL on then if someone raises, he's not going to fold to three bet. And if someone calls someone else's race, they are not going to fold to three bet. So against UTG open and two or three callers, when you decide to three bet from the blinds and try to steal the pot, you, your folding equity to win the pot free flop is close to zero. You might have some, if everyone disconnects, you might win the pot free flop. But basically, 90% of the time, everyone calls and you will have a four way pot with pocket jacks, which sucks in three bet pots. So, yes, the idea is really bad. In PLO, you should always assume that pre flop three bet doesn't have folding equity. We don't. Three bet as buff in in PLO. In Holden, we might, because we have brief of folding equity, but in PLO we don't. Sometimes people fold, but it's close to five or ten percent at maximum. So generally, people don't fold the three bet, so don't don't count on pre of folding equity. Next three bet on table four. Let's see what happens. What happens is we shouldn't this flop unless someone decides to call with the king. So we make a small, small bet to make them fall the air and deny any bluffs. And woo, it worked. And Kuba, what hadn't drink even one beer? Wow. Well, what you can do there is to give them free pop ranges and with poker tools and then give them range. What kind of hands they fold to a three bet when someone out of position three bets? Yes. Even if everyone folds 10% of three bets and calling with 90% of their Free of range, you don't have enough money enough with to justify the three bet. ACs, avalanche of ACs. And flop ish. Bad ish. <laughs> we have blockers, but he's not going to fold anything. No. Yeah, in Holden. Raising pocket jacks there is decent. 
But I don't know even in Holder, do you actually three pet proper jacks and try to steal the pot? That that doesn't make sense either. You're raising for value, but in PLO you don't have pre for voting equity with your three pets. If you remember that, then it's going to be a lot easier. Mm, about the hearts. To make things simple, if you are starting to use HUD and you wonder what kind of HUD should I have, then my advice is that you should start with minimal HUD. VPIP, free for praise, three bet, general three stats. The first three stats, this is what I always use to categorize players. You can easily see what kind of player he is, how he approaches poker. Like, why a 777, 76-2? Now, I don't need any other than 76-2 and 2 that I know that this guy is calling station. He doesn't understand why aggression is put in poker, so he probably doesn't understand the concepts about seabets and bluffing and opponents not going to hit the flop often enough and so on. He is just likes to call and tries to hit his hands. This kind of player doesn't make semi-bluffs, might bluff the river if everything misses, but he doesn't do semi-bluffs and understand that okay I, I have enough equity and floating equity. So he approaches poker as fun game where he gets card and he wants to see if the hand he has connects with the board. Then if we have player like don't call something 19, 11, 3, 3 bet 1, probably 3 bet just aces, yeah ace check 4, 4, wow, doesn't make sense might be a short step three bet or whatever but 19 and then free type probably doesn't make big bluffs and then what we have here a was the 7 7 19 only 26 hand but if we assume it's 200 hands and same stats means that 19 and 6 is pretty much around normal tight aggressive 3 for raising 3 bet. So his raising ranges should be quite normal but when he's calling with almost any hand and tries to catch the flop and people who plays a lot of hands and tries to catch the flop means that if they hit any piece they are trying to make the hand they can call with cut shots hope to hit the hand and Kind of players that can call with pretty wide range compared to some other players. So first use those three numbers in your heart and then some standard like the second line here is C bet and fold to C bet. Standard flop continuation bet numbers of course. The thing is that if you have a number in your heart then you need to have a clear idea what you can do with the information. Like if I have how often the opening C bets the flop, and now someone asks me, okay, how does that number affect your gameplay? Like in poker, if we have unknown opponents, 100 pp stacks, no information, we don't have any hard to use, we don't have any information that we can use in our decision making, they are just anonymous players then we have a standard line that's our basic poker strategy what we do against totally unknowns in different situations it's our standard play and now when we have information we can deviate from the standard lines and now let's say ps no porno what ps and ponochi he c bets 55 percent of the time and now someone asked me, what do you do with that number? Does that make you change your standard lines? Okay, it might not. But if this number is 35 with decent sample size, then we can assume that he C bets 
probably for value. Because his seabed is so low. He doesn't like to make seabed bluffs. Or if the seabed is 95, now we know that big portion of his seabed range is made from the buffs. But if you don't know how, you just say, okay, he's seabed 70% and you don't change your standard lines ever, then the number is useless, you don't use it. Oh, I'm going to fold here. The reason why I folded Kings is that he made a pot bet against two players, and with 10 hands, he's played three with opens. Not a super maniac, he might have aces there. It was a UTG open. Don't see he's going to make a pot bet with queens or ace jack. Well, ace jack is probably, or any jack is in his range, but he also might have a random tree or aces quite often. <laughs> so start with the basic. Basic three stats, BPIP, free for brace, three bet, and then if you know how to use C bet stats, then put those on the board as well. And start to play with that hard. Yeah, it's a really small hard. And use that. You get a lot of information from that, that hard. Learn how to use that. And then, if you are familiar with the hard, then you can use pop ups or pop outs, what they are. And if you find yourself looking some kind of specific situation from the pop out often, or you wonder that it would be nice to know what does he do here uh, quite often. Then suddenly you have a need for a stat. And then when you have a need for a stat, then you can add that to your heart. And now suddenly you have a stat in your heart that is useful for your gameplay. And by doing that, eventually, the HUD is always constant process, and eventually, what the fuck? He shoves pocket sevens and he calls with open ender on paired board. All right. Well, that was interesting. So the hunt is constant process and eventually during the time it will evolve and you will have a hunt that is 100% good for your gameplay. Uh, demo 3, we played a 3 bet, looks like aces. Uh, easy call, see if we hit the flop. Well, we don't. Probably he bets the flop and we have to give up. Yes. But the hat I have here is, it has been a, a lot different earlier. Now this is something that I have used a lot, a lot and there's a lot of good information and news. Every number is useful. And I haven't found a need for that. If I was playing a lot of Zoom tables, then I would definitely want to have a hard stat. Um, how often folds turn when calls flop seabed? Because in Zoom, there are a lot of players that seem to call the flop and then fold the turn. Of course, in normal tables, there's still, but especially in Zoom, it, it seems that there's a lot of those players. On level one, let's try to steal the path. 
Uh, if he calls, I'm going to fly the river. He shouldn't have aces. The only hand he slow plays is going to be the quad aces. But that table is just. Um, here, SCP check calls the flop. Doesn't look like a king. So let's give him pressure on the turn. And then on the river, if we make two pairs, we check back. Ace, we check back. Uh, with the king, we are going to bet. Half a pot. That's enough. If he has a king, he's going to call. If I have to draw, he's going to fold, which he does. Oh, Piano Tente almost died. Wow. It should be the peak hour of Friday evening. There were six tables when we started. Now there's only three open. Um, I'm going to open a totally new table. If we don't get action there, then we are just going to open a PLO 4 table or a PLO 20 table. Our bankroll is around. It's a euro table, so we have around 235-240 euros in our crowdfunding bankroll. So, so probably not going to be a lot twenty. Oh, I I called with pocket queens here because I was pretty sure that these guys, Evastin and. Raptuk in Finnish is going to call and we can remove the waypot and we can set mine. And here he just barrels the turn. Doesn't make sense with overbear, so he might have an eight. I'm going to fall. So when it overbear, they give up, and with air, they often give up. Because when I call the flop, I have something. So the baron that something to fold is a bit optimistic. Here yeah, we have a dark blazer who buys only 80 BBs. Let's see when the heart comes, if we have a stand, yes, 43, 40. And I'm going to call the river to And he had a Seth. Wow. And value bets the Seth when the straight comes. That is so strange. Well, got a good value. Has been pretty aggressive post flop. Now we hit the nuts here. I'm going to keep up here on the river. And um, let's put the money in with the nuts. Thing is that against the draws, we are in a little worse shape than normally because we block one of our own outs. But it's still a top set. Just get the money in. And he should get it in. He puts it against a lot of people and he has a wrap ouch. Can we dodge? Yes, we can. Ooh. So Dark Wager is pretty aggressive when he is the preflop aggressor. It's three, but run down. The thing about 
thing heads up is that the rape is just going to kill. Although in macro game it's a smaller rape, but as Tetris doll who plays heads up a lot, he was playing in, in smaller stakes against an opponent and found out that when he stepped off his opponent he only found like 70 BP for value. Uh, I once played in my throws and I poker heads up and I stopped because we battled for like half an hour and the thing is that after half an hour both of us were losing over two buy-ins and when you play half an hour for heads up and both players are losing two buy-ins then you can see that it's not profitable so the rate was so insanely high that it's just insane I'm going to race here versus Eva Stina. Standard semi buff. And uh, it's Barrow the turn. And he folds. Uh, here, Raitala probably raises as he doesn't. Bad, bad turn. After turn check, I cannot really represent anything so if he has two pairs he's going to call the river if I bet and he shouldn't have air a lot of time there. Couple of the aces and both of them fold. Oh my god. Ah another double shooting ace is and we get one call. I'm going to check here. And let him bluff. And he had a trip sense. Strange bet size on the turn. Because with the trip sense, he really doesn't want to see the river. If he doesn't make a full house, then probably he can value bet it either. And most of the time, a draw completes. So, the Poker Maniac chat is dead. No one has asked anything. And it's 40 minutes of this coaching. In Twitch, Krupa is the only one confessing that he was the cutie blonde yesterday. Who did something funny. Uh, with an up flush draw here, we can call and just draw on table four. No reason to bet the river. He's not going to fold any better hands, and now he puts all in. Uh, we have a cut shot. So, flush draw with the cut shot. If he has a set, then we have around nine outs. That's a seven outs for flush. 10 out is going to be 23% and we need a bit more so this is not enough. Almost enough. If you have been any smaller of if it wasn't all in, if you have any implied odds then we can call there but now it's just, it's not enough. Can we open it here? No. 
I'm coming, let, let's see. Was it this one? Yes. Um, we would need to pay 45 and half BBs in the pot of 149. So we need 30% equity there. And we have 23. So it's a fold. Who buys you drinking beer? I would like to drink beer too. But I have to wake up at 5.30 a.m. tomorrow in seven hours. Why the hell am I playing here? Um, and another thing, if I was playing with my own money, then drinking beer wouldn't be a problem. Having one or two beers is good, but now when it's crowdfunded, it would be quite unethical to drink a beer and play with someone else's money. So, that's why I don't drink beer in coaching. Although it might be fun, fun to do a coaching where I'm playing like some small stage, PLO5 or something, playing with aggressive style and just having beers, like 10 beers, 12 beers, some shots, just getting slightly drunk and playing loose aggressive poker and having fun. That would be nice. Maybe bring up Marcus and guitar, playing some heavy music at the same time live. I don't know if we can do a simultaneously through Skype call if Marcus sings and I'm going to play guitar or the other way around. That would be horrible. So just playing some heavy metal classics, drinking beer and playing piano. That would be nice. Maybe at summer. Maybe. Sounds nice. A stiff master, it's three bed. Oh, vital draws. And on this board, let's make a small C bed. Uh, I think both players are kind of players that are just going to fold if they don't hit it hard. We don't have to make a real big C bet because if they call, we're screwed. So we can save the money when they have a hand. No reason to put there. So where was I with the heart? Yeah, uh, the answer should you get someone else's heart is definitely no because then you have there some stats that you are not familiar with you don't have a need for them and the more numbers you have in your heart the more it confuses and distracts you but once you have used the constant process approach you know what the numbers are you don't have to think like oh my god what was this number i have to check it then it gives you more information and faster than it would give if, if it was someone else's hunt. And a really nice example was some years ago I watched a video where some uh, one high stakes pro made a video and in, in the beginning of the video he was going through with his heart. He was a slightly bigger than this, and he thought that okay, BPIP, free for this, free bed, blah 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 blah. And then on the second line, was so second or third number, he stopped and started thinking, oh, what was this number? He was using Holder Manager, so he couldn't see by just hovering the mouse, and he couldn't figure out what the number was. So what he did that 
he opened the pop out and tried to find an okay it was 33 what is 33 in here which was quite funny so apparently he didn't knew what the stat was and he didn't find it in his pop out so he just skipped the number like okay i i i don't know what this number is i can't remember and i was thinking that what the fuck you have that on your hand how can you use number 33 if you don't know what it means what the number is and that is just insane to me that there's a high stakes pro playing and making video and he has a heart that he doesn't know all the numbers how can he use the heart so that was quite funny to me like dude know your heart before you start to play with it Yeah, for Krupa, it's very difficult to watch the stream and play at the same tables. Um, we actually have a rule for that. If you watch the stream, you cannot sit on the same tables. And there are situations where we have seen that someone is watching the stream and sitting at the same tables. And there's actually I can tell you about one situation where we did some investigations and we managed to find that player's phone number. So I called him and told him that yes, this is Kuberi from Poker Arminias. You were abusing the stream yesterday. Now you have two options. You can either pay me back this amount that I estimate that was lost in EV or I can give you name, address, and phone number to the crowdfunders and police, and you can deal with them. And that's why we have the two minutes. Um, here is one of the situations that we have a cut shot. We have middle pair. I'm going to call and see the turn, if the turn helps us at all. Now if he barrels a turn, then he has more than just from random top pair or something. So we don't have that 30% equity anymore that we need. But if the turn is a spade or gives us two pairs, then we can happily step off. As he has a lot of rundowns, his free bet has been some Run down and I'm not sure if he's going to ever fold them. If we had a queen and same hand, Jack was just a queen, then I would just get it in because we have the top pair. But if he has any queen XXX, we are in a pretty bad shape. What window just popped in my... I don't know. Oh, we have the nuts here. Didn't didn't see it. But some window popped on my computer. Uh, those mean bets post for those make fake stats. That's one thing that can alter the heart. But if someone is making a lot of mean races and mean bets, it increases their accuracy. But then you can make a note. Mean bets a lot. So yes, mean bets can change and screw the hard numbers a bit, but if the sample size is big enough, then you ha should have a note about them, mean raising. A lot of people actually use someone else's hard. They actually pay people money to send them their hard profiles. And the reason is, Pretty much always, well, I'm going to translate it. The reason is I'm too lazy to do the work myself. They always say that I don't have time to work with the pop outs. Well, if you have time to play every day, skip one day from playing and use one day for making your heart. So it's, a, it's an excuse. I'm too lazy. That's the real reason.
So build up your own HUD uh, and how to use HUD. I didn't talk about that. Uh, as I said, I use it often that these three numbers are the most important one. Petting Paul, 53 hands, 68, like 70, 50, 40. He is aggressive. Now that's pretty much what we need to know. He is a maniac. And now we just have to figure out, okay, how do how do we make money versus maniac? And that's the biggest thing about HUD. Uh, sometimes people say that you don't need or HUD is using it at micros. <coughs> I don't find it useless. If you can figure out that we have four different type four different types of poker players. Basically they are Maniacs, calling stations, nits, and wrestlers, which are very aggressive. And versus each one of those four, we make money in different way. So, if you know how to make money versus maniacs, now getting this 70, 50, 40 makes it easier for you to make money. And demo three, if they both check, I'm going to bet half a pot. Because if they had a flush, I would assume they bet unless it's a small flush. And now if their calling range or continuation range here is only small flushes, then we should get the forwards one out of three times, which is enough. And even if they're probably two pairs of sets, we have the cut shot. So is plus EV bet and they fold. Ooh. And Jan yeah, I said you shouldn't use one day to make your hunt. Well I said you can use one day if you're slow and you want to do the hard with the color codings and then work out with all the pop-outs for the river. Uh, this is actually something that <laughs> now this this is something. Uh, it sucks because now I just say that someone is lazy. Well, I haven't done my pop outs ever. It has been a project for me in two or three years. But <laughs> I didn't have time. Yeah, I was just lazy. I always had better things to do. But I don't use pop outs much. I have the other information here that I'm going to use in the gameplay. Uh, pop outs can use. Uh, my approach is. Let me jump to the explanation. My approach is that in the heart. We have the information that we use every day on every session. And in the pop-outs, we can have information that is more rarely. That is, isn't that, doesn't happen that often. But I'm using all the hard stats often and I can't remember when I last time checked the pop out. Uh, the only thing I look in the pop out is what is his all in adjusted minis. And that is just often for fun. It doesn't change my gameplay, but it's nice to know if someone is making money or not. So if you want to do all the pop-outs, design them from scratch and so on, then you can use one day, depending on how much you drink beer while doing that. Yeah. So always make your own hot. Now we have aces and the maniac folds pre-flop. How suspicious is that? And we get a call. Board is quite sucky. Uh, I'm going to check it back. And now we can bet. 
Clifford. Uh, here a tie is player three bets. Broadway card heavy. So let's scroll and hit the flop and separate the flop. Kaboom. And he calls with ooh, he has a higher draw. Was actually a favorite with just four overcards. That's PLO. We have to pair and a wrap, and opponent has just four overcards and is six different favorite. And there, uh, about the hearts, often people think that, okay, I can use this, that this might be useful, this might be useful. If you build that hard from scratch, like you buy that six pack of beer and you open your portrait trap and think that, okay, now I'm going to make the perfect hard. And then you go through the stats that, can I use this one? Can I use this one? Can I use this one? And suddenly you will have a monster hard. But when you create monster hard, what happens is that you have their 30 or 40 stats and you cannot remember those. And how could we induce this guy? So first rebate, which kind of sucks, so I'm going to make it small. Let's assume that he thinks it's rundown or weak and decides to forbid. It's like poking him, trying to annoy him to show me who's the boss. Well, we hit the ace, which is nice. We have to wait for a while, and then we bet. So if you just create a 40 stat hunt, then oh, we get the money in. Thank you. What do you have? You have ace, jack, queen, deuce. You are throwing dead on this. It's a dead. Oof. Almost saw a ten there. So if you have a 40 stats, then you are going to use the HUD, and there are some stats that you are going to use more often than the others, which means that then you will remember those stats. But then there's like often from 10 to 20 stats that you don't use often, which means that you probably don't even remember. And the thing is that when you have a HUD, if someone comes beside you and points out one stat like, what is that stat there, 43? And then if you have to wait for over five seconds, then you are not going to use that stat when you are playing. I mean, if you don't know in just the one or two seconds what is the stat, then you are not going to use it. Sorry. But then you have a monster hard that you use half of the stats, you think that this is great hard, but there's 20 stats is just working as distraction for you. So always, it takes more time to start from the small heart and improving it little by little, but it will be better in the end. And Pupa said on the tweets, a uh, good point that Brief of Maniac may not be the Maniac post flop anymore. Uh, that's why Hunt is also nice with betting ball. We can see that post flop is not a crazy maniac. C bet 20, which is indication the sample size is 4 out of 21, which is for C bets, it's, it's pretty decent sample size. So the thing is that he plays a lot of hands, he opens a lot of hands pre flop, C3 bets, ton of hands pre flop, but on the flop, he C bets only 1 out of 5 times. Uh, both of apparitions, 42%, 38 50%, these are normal. 4 to C, but 50. So, both of he plays actually pretty straightforward ish. Doesn't make any huge bluffs, probably. So, this is one of where that really aggressive pre flop, but straightforward post flop.
Yeah. Um, this is one reason why I love portrait tracker is that when you put your mouse over a stat, you can see there easily dark flop in non three pet path. Sample size is six opportunities, has done it once. So if we check that, okay, he don't 17 present, wow, he don't chill out. Oh, with the ace is in on table three, flipping time versus, ooh, bad one down, and we suck. But can we hold? Ooh, we were in faddish situation on the flop. So that here, 70 percent dog bet, and now we think, okay, he's dogging a lot, but in fact, the reality is that he has dog once, and we cannot make any assumptions about his dogging range when it's one. It's if it's two out of 16, uh, two out of 12, then. If there's a bit more, if it's 5 out of 30, then it does us a lot more. But once, we have no idea if he has hit the hand or not, he made it once. And that's one of the problems if you just look at the number without any sample size. Like someone three bets once, and he might have a three bet of 33%, if it's one out of three times. So we think, that, oh, three bet 33%, maniac. And the thing is that he has three but once and it was aces. We have the nuts with the retraw. And uh, double suited four uh, have to put here. And now he can make a decision if he wants to call or not. We are quite happy to end the hand here because there's there isn't a lot of chance to get value on the river so if we just call the turn it means that mm, pretty much most of the times on the river we have a bluff catcher we cannot value bet it and if opponent bets then we just have to decide if we want the bluff catcher or not so it's just raised there so HUD is really useful even in PLO2. Yes, you cannot make any super fancy plays where you make a tricky line based on the HUD information. That's not going to happen in PLO2. But PPIP, brief of race, three bet, three numbers to categorize your opponent. And that makes a lot of money in the micros. Because at micros you have these um, extreme opponents. Calling stations are really extreme calling stations. Maniacs can be hundred, hundred, hundred extreme maniacs. Uh, oh, I'm going to three bet, please. Uh, if he was a better regular calling, is fine option, but. He's kind of player that is going to play really straightforward post flop. So we have a lot of phone in equity on the flop. Of course, here we are going to get it in. Ace is in flush draw, but open the folds. Nice. If we think about decision making in poker, the thing is that the table is full of information. And often the problem for most players is that they don't know what info not the ACs. We really have an avalanche of ACs today. Sorry. Um, the thing is that we don't know what information to use. If he checks, I'm going to bluff here. Oh, another. Oh, he had a nice call. Of course, he's not going to fold set. But, um, another time, AC is SPR under one. We're just going to fit it in here. We don't have to think about anything else. If he has a deuce, he's going to call. And he has a 10. Wow, he's drawing pretty thin unless he makes a straight. No, he doesn't. 
Oh, he had a flush draw too, so he's not in that bad shape. What, he had 40 or something? Forty-three. Actually, why not? That backdoor, backdoor straight gave him a almost ten percent equity. So we've been running pretty hard today. Yesterday we run pretty bad. Today we run pretty hard. That, as I said yesterday. When you have that horrible session when everything goes wrong, don't worry, it will even out. Uh, here we have a three bet from now. The heart is um, where is he? Is there? Oh, don't want the four, but let's just draw and it's a three way. It's a bit trickier. Let's see if he see bets and what the other guy does. If he folds, I'm going to shove. We should have 40 with the entrance, bare aces, we have 40%. If he has aces with flush draw, we are screwed, but. And he gets in with just bare aces, nice. Oh, he makes it on the river. That's a bad step off in my mind. And he was 60%, so we had the 40%. Uh, table 2, top 2, and open ender. Let's get the money in. No option. Yeah, on table two, running bad, only 40 BP is profit. My bad. Oh, now we are on table four, we just lost the 10 BP, uh, 100 BP is to a guy who should have 40 to flop. Well, I'm not sure, but we should have 40 in equity versus bare aces. And if we have any phone in equity, then the shop is fine because we have 40% equity if he draws. Straight and trips. No action. Wow, people are just giving up. What is wrong with them? Uh, another thing that we can use the hard for is, like I have here, well, what is right color? See what the hand is, oh, that's for. Uh, here we have how often he folds from the big blind against the button open, how often he folds small blind against the button open. So when, it, when it's unopened to us on the button, I can see here uh, how often the opponent folds from the blinds. And then here on the top, I have a how often he folds bit blind to small blind open. And these three stats are mostly used in the zoom, where there's a lot more situations when it's unopened to you on the button. And you can steal a lot of blinds from the button. So if we can see some extreme numbers here, then we can open any four. Or if the opponent is super tight, and we don't yet have a sample size on the blinds. Uh, I'm actually going to fold because Raikala makes a bet instead of free flop. So he might have actually aces. And now some guy makes a four bet. It's not even a pot sized. What the crap? I don't know. I'm just going to play, get away with my queens. Uh, some other things that if opponent folds a lot to C bets, then we can in head support C bet any flop with profit. Because an average is just going to fold often. Or 
if someone folds a lot of seabeds to seabeds and suddenly raises flop, then we can think that okay, it's really, really weighted for value. Or if someone folds only a Kia Raikala 38%, of course, the sample size is only 16. Um, this is why it's so nice that you have the possibility to hover the mouse. Like we have four and uh, three and a half hundred hands on him, so it looks like big sample size. Four to see, but sample size is only 16. Um, here, this calling station calls the flop, so he likes his hands. He's not going to fold it. So it was just a seabed flop and then give up unless turn really improves us. Or turn is an ace, which would be a nice card to barrel. Really, with really tight player opens, uh, I don't want the three bet. Let's call and see the flop. And top two. This is probably stack of material. It is a stack of material. Let's just draw. He is really representing the straight here. 71, 23. Does it look like a bluff? What? Fifteen A opens C bets and check mean raises. I'm actually going to fold. That is just screaming aces or a nine. Ooh. <laughs> Funny thing, uh, as I'm using my own nickname, I actually thought that at Poker Loco you can change your nickname as with some other micro gaming sites, but you can't. So I just thought that yeah, I can use Tubebetty for logging in and then I just change it. Well, you cannot change it. So now I'm using my own nickname. So now there's someone asking me on the Skype that hey, Tubebetty is Tubebetty. You at micro gaming. Now everyone wants to beat me. Uh, here I don't have a bot as a semi bot, but he raises, so you can have it. Let's see if we hit the flops. Um, we are going to end at 11 finish time, so in 15 minutes, as I really have to wake at 5.30 a.m. Insane wake up time at Saturday. And here we hit the nut flush draw and the cut shot to nuts. So definitely bet. And here everyone checks, so it's unlikely they have the flush. So it's good to stab as them up of they might call it two pairs or slow plate sets, but we have the open ender to back it up. And here table one. If he checks, we see that, and we can assume that he is going to fold often enough. Now he calls, so he often has a queen.
only three three bets. I have a remembering that this guy is quite tightish. I'm going to fold. His three bet number is eight, but it's only three three bets. So someone has three bet three times. So um, now he don't, which isn't quite nice because we have the nuts. Let's see if he has them too. And yeah, yes, he does. Did he have it? Yeah, on the river. <laughs> what did he call the flop with? Uh, oh, he's the one with four, five, seven. So he had a wrap on the flop. So we are entering the last 15 minutes. Today we are running quite above EV. There were a lot of all-ins where it's almost 50-50, 60-40 and we have held up. And remember that on Sunday we have from zero to hero session with Deja and some of the earlier sessions have been more the theoretical now we are going to go through hand histories and sessions and let's find out what Deja is actually doing on the tables. So that's going to be on the Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. at finish time. So some of you have to put alarm clock to wake up. But this UV UV has folded two times of two versus button op uh, small blind open. But this flop is 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 really 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 bad. We have a double cut shot, and we actually made it. Nice. Oh, we hit the queen here. Did he call us? No. And let's just put here. Let's see if we have any value. No. No. Huh. Mm. People are so tight. It's Friday evening. Shouldn't be. Nice hand on table one. Of course, if it would be a queen of spades and king of hearts, it would be a lot better. Now it looks a lot better than it actually is, but it's definitely still in our opening range from any position. And we hit the wrap. So now the hand, hand weighs itself. If someone raises, we call. And so on, and so on, and so on. I'm going to bet for value here. If he has it, then he's going to call on raise. But he has also some flush draws, some queen nine type of hands. 
and he had a four of a kind. Didn't see that one coming. Slow plays like a boss. Try waits for so long and three bits, so it looks a lot like the ACs. If you make a fast three bit, then it's wide range, but when someone thinks that long, it really looks like the ACs. And asking then chap, uh, rainbow, not actually a really strong hand, but from cut off, it's definitely open. It uh, has, a, has the high card value, we can make top pairs, two pairs, and sometimes we make some straights, but as we don't have any flush draws, it kind of reduces our hand strength. And here on the turn, we make the top pair and cut shot. Um, I'm actually going to bet here, because I would assume he bets a lot of his strong hands. And the thing is that we can have Chap 9 in our range, Pop and Thins, so I don't assume he's going to check flop and check race turn as a bluff often. Uh, here and there before I'm going to isolate this stiff master limper. Uh, Kidmo now mean raises. I'm going to three bet. Um, if he four bets, then it's easy to play. We call and see the flop. And of course, now we have to stack off. Ooh. We don't have folding equity, and I don't assume we're going to win the pot ever with pocket tens because he has a queen or king jack type of hand or jack nine. So we're going to check, and we don't improve. Uh, here we hit open ender with the flush draw. He had aces. Wow, slow plays like a boss. Oh, he had aces with the flush draw, so we were drawing six outer and a couple of kings, so we had eight outs. Not the end of the world, but kind of set up there. 24 only on the flop with open inner and the flush draw and over pair. Often when Texas Holden players start to play PLO, they are quite amazed because in Texas Holden, your hand strength is just a couple of words. But in PLO, you always have, even if you have total air on the flop, you suddenly have double cut shot and backdoor flush draw, backdoor, people straight draw, backdoor, another flush draw. You always have a shitload of backdoors. These 71 three players are kind of players that really like the slow play. They don't like to be aggressive.
Like with the quads, tipped twice. So they don't understand the concept that you have to build up the pot to, be, to win more. They are just happy to win pots. They don't care if it's one euro or ten euros. Um, he has ace or a flush almost always here. Yep. But the thing is that if he's always drawing and when he actually hits something he doesn't get any value, it's impossible for him to make profit in the long run. I'm going to barrel on table two because he has a flush draws that he's going to call a six might call any which ace might call and now on the river no reason to bet let's see what he has and he had eight eight six four what and still he had almost 30 percent on the turn wow People always amaze me. Uh, here we have middle pair and a wrap. 100 BPs, definitely see bet and just get it in. Live mic is going to be a green one. So we're going to end up in less than five minutes. I think we ended up in profit. Not sure because there were a lot of situations where we actually lost the buy in and just reloaded. And now we are up somewhere around slightly over four buy ins. So it actually might be close. I have a feeling that we are making profit, but you never know. Normally it doesn't matter, but with crowdfunded, we have to check the profits after each session. Poseidon is a green one. And we get a tree bet. I'm going to call we're in position and I'm sure we can stack him off if we hit hard enough. So he is three betting with widest range. I don't know why this don't just call if he thinks that he is kings is if he doesn't believe that why always me has aces, then why doesn't he just get it in preflop? I, I don't know why he sees the flop and then decides to get it in. Um I'm going to explain this in a bit, why I bet the turn. Just we're going to see it out. If we open the hand. We haven't marked any hand. Oh dear. But this isn't poker choose material. I'm just going to explain it like in replay. Or at least we have one explanation at the end of the session for strategy, strategy content.
Group I think that I might give too much respect for my opponents. Um, against some opponents I do, but if you have an example, I'm happy to explain it further. Most of the time at low stakes, people have what they represent, especially if it's a barrel bet or it's a raise. One bet can be easily bluff, but the double barrel or raise is most often for value. Of course, there are some situations where we have reason to believe otherwise, but as a standard rule. But if Kuba has any examples, I'm happy to explain my thinking process there. Like when Kidmo 15 and 8, 200 hands, super tight, hasn't raised flopped once. I would say that when he check close the flop and check mean raises the turn, it's for value and it's then the range is super strong. Double cap on the middle, not good. Where is the hand I just opened? Oh dear, I have to find it. Now I can't remember what was we had pocket jeans. There it is. All right, so let's open this hand. So what happens is that on the flop, now our options are either to bet or slow play. And oh, what happened? Uh, if we want the slow play, then we need to be sure that it gives us more profit. And now, if we think that all can going to check to induce bluffs, the question is, this one is pretty tight, this is a bit more aggressive. How many opponents will bluff twice? If you check the flop, how many opponents will bet the turn and barrel the river when you call the turn with air? And I would say that mostly none. People might make a half a bet bluff on the turn. So if we check here, we can yes induce half a bit bluff from air. So in total air, we might get 60 cents, 6 BB is more value. But the question is, if opponent has a four, if we check he's going to bet the turn, we call a raise. If we raise, he might call, he might fold. But on the river with trips, he's going to check forward or check call. Uh, if opponent has a four, then again, it's, especially on the short, it doesn't matter what we do. But again, it's 200 BBs deep. If we check the flop, it's almost impossible to stack the opponent off unless he has a quad or better hand. 
So, I bet half a bot. This guy doesn't raise, but he might make a raise as a bluff. And once he raises, he might think that I'm already invested money in the pot and he just calls me. He might have a week for up into barrel. He doesn't have a stack, but we can get more value from his bluffs that way. Or even if he raises and then gives up, it gives us more value by checking the flop and getting half a pot on the turn. So if someone wants to bluff this board, we get more value actually by value betting. So on the flop, value bet is the superior decision. But now on the flop, now the same thinking process comes again. Do we chip or do we bet? Okay, we know that he cannot have, or he can have king four, but most likely he doesn't have anything super strong. Often the strongest hand is four ten. We can stack off versus that. Or if he has trips, we can probably stack him off when he's shorty. But thing is that if we check here, he might bet his missed flush draw on the river. So we get one bet as value from flush draws. If we bet the turn, if he calls the flop with flush draw on paired board, he is probably calling the turn with flush draw. Because he doesn't believe we have a full house. So if we bet the turn, we get that same one bet of value on the turn. So the value is same, except if he makes the flush on the river, we can get a second bet. So against the flush draw, now we have a chance to get three streets of value. Checking the turn, we only get two streets of value. So betting here is better. Uh, he might have aces, he'll close the turn, might go on the river. The thing is that he shouldn't have any air. And against the hands that hit the board, we are most likely, unless it's a trips or full house, we're getting one bet, one street for value. And by checking, we can get it probably on the river if he bluffs or he check for his missed flush draw. We didn't get any value. <coughs> so all the hands that might give us value on the river are going to keep the value on the turn anyway. But by betting the turn, we have a chance to get more value on the river. So once again, when we compare the up and ups and downs from checking or betting, I think betting is superior. It doesn't have to be big. And he calls and then on the river, but it's so big, he steps off, which is nice. But I see a lot of players that might actually check back here and just think that yes, I'm going to check to induce bluffs, which in a sense is correct, but when you take it one step further, okay, how much I'm going to get value from the bluffs when I check, you can see that okay, I get six BBs as value from the bluffs. If someone wants to bluff me, can I get more by betting six BBs myself? Now, the standard 50 50 bluffing rule is that. This is kind of flop where I might actually be, well, now he has trips, but if this is five, eight, three, five, seven, I might raise here to 170 or 180. Ton of fraud in equity. So now we actually get 70 or 18 BBs value from his bluffs. So it's three times more. So if you think about checking here, then your thinking process is quite short. You don't think further, you think only the flop and the next action, but you don't think three steps, four steps further. So definitely bet on the turn, definitely bet. And of course on the river will be bet. If opponent folds, then we couldn't have any value from him anyway. So that's why it's important to bet. That is not a situation to slow play. And if he's 100 BP steep, all the same concepts apply. So, Slow playing is rarely a good option if we think about the overall EV we get from the hand post flop. <laughs> all right. Um, oh, the results. You are all waiting for that. Here are the results. $34, 33.99. EV on 6.5, as I said, we ran pretty hard, of course, 
12 BPs per 100 hand is still running hot even in EV. But here it is. Boom, kaboom, here we just had. We're super lucky. So it's nice to run over after yesterday's not so fun run. And $34, uh, $34 as profit. Quite nice. Around 25, 26 for the crowdfunders. Congratulations. Now I'm going to hit the bed, have to wake up early, and I'll see you all on Sunday with Daya. Now, thank you for watching the stream. Thank you for the discussion, especially Poopa and Animetsa, and hope you found something useful. Now, in the end, we're going to watch a flat video and then enjoy your Friday. Bye bye. So you're saying I can ask this cat any question? The cat is connected to the computer. You just type in the question, it will read his mind. There's the answer, Cole. You're the man! I've been looking for this for weeks.